Hello, everybody. I would like for you to tell me why you're here. You can write that on the chat. While you do that, I will start sharing my screen so that we can start. Hopefully you can see my presentation here. I don't have a lot of visual feedback, so please, Mario, let me know if you, you know, see something on the chat. I'm trying to connect on the iPad as well, but anyway. As I was telling you, my name is Jorge Roldan. So I don't know, they just out of curiosity, you can try to figure out where I'm from based on how I speak. So that's going to be, you know, like a mystery, if you will. What is it that I do, where I'm from? If you want to find out more about that, you can let me know later. I have planned for a couple of things here. So what is it that we need to be an organization that learns and that has the capacity to adapt to context changes? And the next question would be, are we comfortable or uncomfortable with change? So what is the first thing you think of with this question? Are you comfortable or uncomfortable? You can write that on the chat. Well, I know that there are people behind the screen and well, it's easier for me to be able to tell a little bit about this. Okay, so Karina, yeah, more or less, comfortable. Okay, great. Anyone else? What about you, Mario? How do you feel? Yeah, I've changed this one like a thousand times. So how do you feel with uncertainty? Okay, anyone else? So you're multitasking here, great. Mario, more or less. So you're suffering a little bit with me, Mario. So thanks, Mario. Okay, I love it, I love it. Well, people, yeah, well, this will be recorded if you want to watch it later on, but uh, let's move on. Today's talk. Uh, I, I like this phrase very much from Enans Martin. I'm not uh, here to make you feel comfortable with a change, but to accompany you in this change so that you feel comfortable in uncomfort and discomfort. So let's talk a little bit about the past. What are the things in your life are the same that you, you had 10 or 20 years ago? Take a minute for the What things in your life are just the same as 10 or 20 years ago? Is there anything in your life that's exactly the same? Well, um, yeah. Well, one of my teachers, my mentors, when she asked me this question, I was like, whoa. Well, in my own case, very little things. And what about you? You can use a chat for that. Okay, so yeah, let me be. Is there anyone here that says like anything has changed in my life? Weird, there, we don't have the same DNA. Almost anything's the same, that's crazy. A lot of water has uh, uh, flown through the bridge, under the bridge, lots of changes. Just think about the last year. The world was very, very different. That's crazy, isn't it? Okay, so now I'd like to keep thinking on changes, but now let, let's add a component, emotion. Those changes that you decided and other changes that were uh, imposed by others or changes that uh, were brought by life. For example, I moved my country of, uh, where I live, and not once, or but twice, I selected this, and things happened to me. But then, 
well, things happen in my belly when I have to go through changes imposed by others. And the changes that I had with life through the pandemic, well, I like seeing the glass we sometimes see it empty, but I like it, like seeing it a little bit fuller. I'm a little bit of an optimistic, but there are a lot of emotions that come with changes. And, well, that's interesting to acknowledge all that, to record them. Marshall Rosenberg, empathic communication and nonviolent communication, speaks about the needs before being satisfied, they have to be seen. So we have to identify which are the emotions and which are the needs that are covered or satisfied or needs that are not met. That is a lot. So it is okay to have emotions. All the emotions that we go through with changes. In change, we can go to denial, frustration, depression. We can go through many different emotions until we uh, in, in, analyze them better. And we're going to talk a little bit about this in this conversation. And well, this curve might be a simple model or reduce of everything that happens to us. Um, this sounds very simplistic and easy, but, uh, but I have a question. How do you take decisions when you are at a foggy place? Tell me about those. What triggers you? Is there a lot of fog? Is it that foggy or it isn't that foggy? Tell me a little bit about that. Let's say that there is a jungle or a forest and it's very foggy. What would you do? So you would go slow, I'm careful, great. I watch, I like it. Okay, I go carefully, great, great, great. I really like this because that's exactly the thing. And we sometimes think that in our own context where we are, we think that um, there's uh, not that fog as much as we think there is. So, okay, well, in other words, it requires a huge effort to face reality with intellectual hum humility, to see that there are lots of variables that we don't understand, but our brain wants to save energy. And we go like, how is this like these? And then I'm gonna be able to you know, go out the street. And, and when I cross the street, a car would run over me, the car will respect the pedestrians. And well, there are lots of messages that we tell ourselves that make us reduce the complexity of the outside world. So, yeah, we can say that it's crazy because on the one hand, we can predict, predict that we will have an eclipse at a given moment. But on the other hand, we cannot know the price of dollars tomorrow. Like, that is crazy. I mean, math all over science, and we still have all these problems being able to know the price of dollars tomorrow. Why is that? Or all the memes that we saw with the pandemic, like, yeah, you have to go get rush and buy all toilet paper available. And lots of things started to happen when the pandemic started. And well, what's interesting here is that this shift of paradigm of abandoning expectations and mainly control to direct to predict so in all those contexts that are foggy such as well this invitation is to face them with intellectual humility is this the right way to take one step at the time to see if there are no cars approaching us like when there's no fog you just move there's no problem but in places that are foggy, where there's some kind of uncertainty. We're gonna talk a little bit about this. We're gonna use the word buka that's linked to this, with all these volatile and uncertain and, and ambiguous con uh, context. And a new word, or this acronym that I have for you, but it has to do with this. How do we face reality? How do we take decisions when it's not that foggy or when it is that foggy? So, in order to, um, well, I like I would like to travel for a minute to the future. We've already spoken about the past, and now let's stop for a minute. And if we think about the world in 10 or 20 years, for the ones here with children, so 
how do you see the world when they are our age? And, well, I love movies. I love all these uh, futuristic movies. I'm thinking about, I don't know, not just uh, Back to the Future, but I'm thinking about uh, this other movie, Mr. Robot, Black Mirror, all these different series that tell these stories that uh, seem not to be believable, but some other crazy things. So how do you see that future? Would you imagine the future? Are we going to keep using these uh, devices? Is it going to be like the movies that you see, like all these holograms and things? Well, I have two things that I want to share with you, things that are happening already. And that uh, I would like to tell you a brief uh, introduction to things that drive me crazy. One of them has to do with artificial intelligence for you to go to the supermarket. And well, lots of things are happening around the world. Like for instance, this intelligence, artificial intelligence, Mario next like, or there is this other example, the sensor revolution. That's like the rapi of the future, like the comp competition of Walmart, you use an application and then these robots go collect your order and then they send all these auto automatically and it's all automated. So there are places where you can do all these kind of innovation. I really like this vision of, uh, of uh, centaurs that are uh, like uh, Santiago Belinkis and the machine and man, how to, how to take advantage of that potential. But well, what I want to tell you is that many crazy things are going on, great and wild things are happening, but where is it what the human beings are adding as a value? What can we do as people? What can we say, okay, this technology can be used in the smartest way and how can we adapt to context changes? And well, this is my presentation about, my dear, we can please go to the next slide. Well, I have this page over here. It's a little crazy. You can go to that page. And that is, if I'm an accountant, what is the percentage of possibility that that job does not exist any longer in the future? Might be like a very fatalistic point of view, but uh, where do we have to reinvent ourselves to add value? In many hospitals I see in New Amsterdam that uh, when you go to the emergency room, they have a computer next to it that gives them a diagnosis based on what the patient says. So it's not giving up our intelligence, but using the machine so that we don't have to have all that in our life. I'm gonna leave this uh, page here. We're gonna share it in social media later. So the next one. So this is a new word. That's a, a bunny. This is the acronym bunny, like a brittle world that's nonlinear, non that leads to anxiety, and it's incomprehensible. So there's more fog than, than we think. So what to do with this? This is the question that I have. Uh, and to, how do we get ready for the present? So there are three pieces of advice over here that I would like to, to see. Let, next slide, please. So what are the mindsets or skills that uh, I think that... Uh, well, Cork is not saying these, and there are many philosophers and people out there talking about these, that I can, that, uh, well, these things break my mind. And, well, and I want to share a little bit of what happens to me, and I think that this could be useful to have a conversation. So the first one is to explore, explore complexity, but mainly to erase it with intellectual humility that's the hardest thing that i see the brain tries to save energy and uh, we think that everything's clear and that we know how things go and for this to be true the future has to be very similar to the past so that i can apply 
those recipes that work or those formulas that work for me in the past, but in the present. So the invitation is to face with intellectual humility these foggy places. If you are at a place without any fog, go on. But if it's foggy, follow some basic rules. What are the principles that guide your decision-making processes? Inspection and adaptation and this empirical approach we're doing becomes thinking like I do, I learn, and then I see if I'm on the right path, and then I take the next step. And then we have to be humans. We have to come back to basic, radical empathy, connection with others, connection with ourselves, with uh, what we want to achieve, why do we want to achieve so. To me, that is that is the secret recipe. To me, trust and confidence, uh, like, a, like a bank account, I would say. A game that uh, we uh, deposit money, we withdraw money, and we do whatever possible not to be in red numbers. If uh, there's something that uh, broke, trust a little bit, it vulnerated distrust. I like talking about CC, CB, CR, the quality of conversations is equal to the quality of the links and it's equal to the quality of the results. So we would all like to have amazing results, to work in organizations that break it. Uh, but now, what kind of uh, links do we have? What kind of conversations are we having? And again, to try to take off our mask or our, our masks and to try to be vulnerable to build to build trust from from the deepest levels of what we are and what we do so yeah for example now it makes me really really nervous not to, to have this uh, 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 to have this conversation that uh, it's just me I get a little bit anxious I'm a little bit nervous and well, after these exercises, we're going to do this. Um, so that will probably make me more, uh, feel more comfortable. And, and to say, well, look, now uh, I'm feeling anxious. I can see your faces or I, I'm not having ideas here. And, and to speak a lot. I mean, I like chatting all the time, but I don't like doing it alone. So the next tip that is... And that is fixed all this time. All these key skills of the 21st century, they have to do with the capacity of uh, having a mental stability and emotional intelligence, like a capability of reinventing ourselves one time and another. Like if I had studied two majors, that was a lot. That was crazy. But now that's not enough. Maybe to change, not just... Uh, mayors, but uh, different professions, like different skill sets. Like, um, so how can we learn? I think that there are two things that I wish they taught me in school, and one of them is I have to feed myself. I feed myself. I do it every day, and I learn lots of things when I was older. And then emotions. It is crazy. It is crazy. Mm. Knowledge is easier to, uh, the other type of knowledge, like software or uh, about physics, or about many other things that are also very fun. But, but I learned that late. And, and uh, I, hopefully the future generations can keep, keep working on this. And, well, the fourth uh, thing in this late, it has to be ninjas, learning, learning ninjas. Perfect. Yeah, and sometimes there's a TED talk that I like very much by Eduardo Brisueño. It's how, how to go from the performance uh, area to learning. We want to be good in what we do because, well, I've already went to college. I mean, that the stage of learning is back, but now I have to be very good in stuff. But uh, all the time we're learning. And mainly those things where we're beginners, where it's hard for us. Uh, we wish that the learning curve was faster. We have a rule at work that is uh, the 60 working hours to work top 
120 hours and to have 40 hours dedicated to learning, to participate in communities. If we don't have space for that, if we don't take space to learn, for learning, for participating in communities, to learn new, new ways of saying things, it would be very difficult for us to improve. Okay, very nice. Yeah, yeah. So these are these are the a big piece of advice that we have to face this future, but in this present. And well, before that question. Yeah, that slide over there. Yeah, I can't see you, but uh, if you are familiar with this exercise already, do it again. And if not, let's all stand up and we're going to cross our arms. I cannot see you, but I would invite you all to do so. And then let the... Let's cross our arms in a different way, a, a different way as we usually do it. And uh, how do you feel doing so? What do you feel? Tell me a little bit. Maybe one or two of you tell me what's happening when, when you cross your arms in a different way. Uncomfortable, strange, perfect, confused. Okay. Now. Okay, so now the question is, what would happen if we tried doing this several times? Like, cross them back. Let's try doing it several times, like coming back. So let's do it now. So how do you feel? How do you feel? Are you feeling the same or is it changing? What's happening now with this new test? I'm a little uncomfortable. So which was your original, someone saying here, like you can remember how you cross your finger. Yeah, practicing different things. It's uncomfortable people. And well, I learned this exercise uh, from Ari Bear, one of the co-founders of Kumuralini. And I like that he asked this question, what is a moment in your teenage years where you said, I'm gonna cross my arms like these. This defines me as a person. Mm, no, that that does not that did not happen to most of us, right? We just started crossing our arms like that, and well, there are lots of things that we inherited. We just do them like that because, well, that's how we saw them. That's how people um, did them. And well, the invitation is try different things. I don't know which is the best way of crossing arms, but what I do know is that it's going to be uncomfortable when we try different things. And if we start trying, lots of times we're not even going to remember which was the original way. And at some point you can say, oh, this is comfortable. But it is also true that your body will want to come back to what uh, it already knows. I felt comfortable crossing my arms like these. Um, and then the invitation here, if you just want to sit down, um, it's cross your arms in different ways. And Mario, next slide, please. Uncomfortable is okay. Feeling uncomfortable. If it does not make me feel uncomfortable of all these things that I'm doing, well, maybe I'm in the first version of crossed arms. So, what is a healthy discomfort? We're going to talk about that, and I would like to uh, get your permission before moving on to, to tell me a little bit what happened to you. Uh, if you are people that have never done this before, that would be even better. So, yeah, if you can join me here at the stage, who wants to join me at the stage? To open cameras, microphones. So what's happening here? No, just one at a time, not all of you.
Come on, come talk for a little bit. Uh, Mario, is there anything specifically we have to do so that they can participate? Yes, they have to click on that blue button that says ask to share audio and video. You can find that button on the upper right corner. All right, who wants to come to the stage for a little bit? So that's ask to share audio and video on the upper right hand side of the screen. All right, just one minute. Let's see if someone wants to join us and we can have a little conversation about this. I kind of put a lot of pressure on the fact that it had to be new people, right? Well, I decided to join you because sometimes when people see someone is already here, they decide to join. That's so wonderful, right? All right, let's see if uncomfortable is really good. It's about making a community and we have to adapt. That's a very good example. Would you like to tell us how that is for you? How about you, Yanina? Well, that phrase, uncomfortable is good. I had a problem with it at first, right? I was like, uncomfortable is not good. And then I realized that if it's always uncomfortable, then maybe it's not good. But if there is some part that is uncomfortable and then that will make you know something you didn't know, for example, that's really good. So I, I, I like to make a note here. It's like, okay, if you're always uncomfortable, then it's like, okay, a red flag, right? Uh, you need to do something about it because if everything in my life is uncomfortable, for example, then that's a problem, right? Thank you, thank you for that. I would like to also see what people have to say on the chat. Eladia, up to you. I was kind of worried, so to speak. I am afraid of being comfortable, you know? We're always talking about the comfort zone and trying to leave our comfort zone. And I'm always trying to learn many things all the time. I don't know, sometimes I focus on what I'm missing and not on what I have. I mean, but that's something that spurs development and being uncomfortable, but actually being uncomfortable is good for me. So I think that's a good opportunity for me, but we have to find that, you know, line. When is it that you have to be comfortable with things When is it that, you know, it's okay to have that discomfort and then you can just go back and reflect on that. That's how I see it. I love that. And now we have Isabel who also would like to share. Hello, everybody. I do apologize because there is a lot of noise at home, but hopefully you will be able to listen to what I have to say. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. I think that this is something we have to learn to live with, right? That being uncomfortable, you have to adapt to that. And sometimes you adapt easily and that's not a problem, but sometimes that discomfort is more constant, it's more present and you have to find strategies so that you don't feel as uncomfortable. Now let's it, let's talk about this. Uh... What is a healthy situation of discomfort? What, what is the tension that's enough with time so that I don't break my back? So, so if I did this every single Monday, if I have a happy conversation like these, 
uh, would probably get some millimeters go or, or let me give you this other example that maybe has to do with this let's say that I want to get um, I don't know like uh, weightlifting and I'm in a hurry to make my biceps grow and then I got the one of 20 kilos and then I'm very enthusiastic uh, and I want uh, because I want to, to make my biceps grow. So then I hurt my arm and I break it and I never go back to the gym again. Or uh, I get the one over one kilo and then I go uh, and I ne don't see any changes. So what is the right weight? It, would it be five or six kilos that my arm can carry? So then I can start with 10 after rehearsing for a long time. But uh, the healthy discomfort is you know it yourself you know that like there are no right recipes for that so the invitation um not even what i think we have to see we have to check we have to test and um, and well we have to start feeling comfortable with uh what is the uncomfort, the level of discomfort that I can tolerate so that I can keep learning, improving, etc. That is what I think. Now that you're here, what happened to you with this idea, with this concept? So this is what they're telling us, you know, to have that parameter of discomfort. I think that's a good criterion. All right, now we have Maribel. That's a similar name, right? What do you think, Maribel? I think this is about finding balance. I think this is about finding a balance between what we are used to and the changes that take place and that sort of discomfort that we feel is part of what we're looking for. I think that it's really important to have that balance between your mind and your body as well. At the end of the day, if we do that, then the new situations that we live especially in this context we are living, will allow us to adapt. And so if we feel uncomfortable, well, at least we will tolerate that better. So that's what I work on. I try to find that mind-body balance. I think that's fantastic. Maribel, I love what you're saying. You said balance, and that's a difficult word, right? It's hard to achieve that, even though we can understand it easily. Now, I would like to tell you a bit more about how to plan differently. Is that okay? You can stay here on stage if you want to. You know, it's actually soothing to see faces. So if that's okay, you can stay. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to the next slide. I love this phrase by Russell Ackoff. And this is about planning. Most plannings within organizations are like a ritual dance to make it rain. There is no effect on the weather, but those who practice the dance believe that there is. A large number of the instructions and advice are actually aimed at improving the dancing, not the weather. So this is about, you know, Sometimes we see there is a lot of energy invested and not so many results. And last year I was making this joke, right? A bad joke. Like, who's like, I was like, who was responsible for planning? Why did you not see that there was going to be a pandemic? 
I was like, okay, now you're helping us, right? But I, I think that what happened really made us realize that planning for three years or five years as we did, you know, maybe that's not so good. And there is a meme actually, right? There are many drawings like these. They are all crazy and intense. And I'm sure you have lived this, right? So this is the difference between the plan and the reality. And the interesting thing here, what I want you to take from this is that now we are embracing that discomfort, but we have to focus on the fact that we want to learn. And this is a mechanical learning and an organic type of learning. So when it's mechanical, we realize that, you know, there was a plan and then it was not going well, but it was too late because many things had been invested in it, you know, time, money, resources, effort, love. And I like to say this in French. Hopefully that's okay with you. Uh, it's a part of my French, but if you want to do something, I mean, you have to choose. You want to do something right or you want to do something fast, but maybe mess it up. I like to talk about the difference between a regular GPS and Waze. Waze is learning all the time. It tells you, okay, so this is, this street is closed, but if you want to get to this destination, then you can go this way, right? So this is like telling you, okay, don't follow the original plan that I gave you. Let's do this. So this is the difference between being plan driven and feedback driven. All right, let's move on. Uh, we still have uh, 10 minutes, only 10 minutes. Maybe this is going to be it because there is a lot of information. Um, you know, there's a lot of information about being feedback driven and being plan driven. We will, of course, share these slides with you. But I would like to have a different type of decision making, not so centralized, you know. Is it like just one pair of hands or is it several pairs of hands that are doing this? Let's move on to slide number 32. All right, so let's think of a team. This is uh, Henry Meaver, he drew this. I love him. So if it's a team, it's so possible, but if it's several teams, then things can get complicated. And we don't want, I mean, sometimes this happens, right? Some, you need to cross a river and some people are building a bridge and some people are building a tunnel. And you realize sometimes too late that this is the situation. And now we have this following phrase. It's really important that what is really important is really important, right? Like in this case, the important thing was to cross the river. So we have two different lines, autonomy and alignment. If there is law autonomy, like on the lower left part of this quadrant, you know, that's more like just following something that someone said at some point, which maybe made sense then, but it doesn't necessarily make sense now. Or you can have good alignment, but low autonomy. Like when your boss is telling you, okay, you have to do this. It doesn't matter if you're talented and intelligent, just do this. And that's not very fun for human beings because we like to choose. We like to contribute our talent, our creativity. There is another scenario. It's more like we're all hippies, high autonomy, but low alignment. So that would be on the lower right hand side. You know, it's like, well, we have to cross the river and someone else is like, well, yeah, hopefully we can do that. But if we have high autonomy and high alignment, once again, we go back to what is important. What is the problem that we want to solve? 
and what can we do to face that problem? And now, this following slide is showing us a question that you can ask in your organizations. What is our criterion for success? We support many organizations and the criteria that they use for our success is like doing things, right? Like if you're busy, you're efficient because they're like, oh, we're doing so many things. Like the agenda is full. I don't have time to eat. You can't imagine the number of things that we do. We have so many deliverables. Well, if that's a criterion for success, well, you have to reflect on that. You have to stop for a bit and try new things. I mean, if that's your case, then the, it will be very uncomfortable to do things different. It would be like a very heavy uh, weight. So you're going to be like, no, we don't want to try that. However, if the criterion for success is like doing more with less, like for example, with 20% of the effort, having 80% of the impact and happy faces, well, that would be great. The interesting thing here is that we don't know what that 20% effort is that will create 80% of the outcome or impact. So we want to deliver value, but if we don't know exactly what is it that we have to do to deliver value, then well, I mean, we can use as an example our cell phones. We have over 100 apps, but maybe four or five have great value and that's why we love our cell phones so much. I don't know, WhatsApp or Instagram or Facebook. It depends on each person. So that theory of complex systems is about maximizing work that has not been done. This is not about doing more, right? This is not about hard work, but about smart work, making better decisions. And that is smart discomfort, right? Being uncomfortable, but in a healthy way to achieve the same results with less effort or even better results, but with less effort. So if we can do that at our organizations, if we can plan differently, you know, to do less and have more impact, then please go ahead. I've talked so much, but I would like to hear you, girls or anyone else who would like to join so tell us about this. What do you think about this? Is it crazy? Am I speaking Greek? This rule, you know, 80-20 has always made me think a lot about how efficient I am. I think that in my case, the ratio is kind of like the opposite. I don't know why. I don't know if it's maybe that I'm doing so many things and I think that I'm doing 80%, but I'm not. It's interesting because I know some people that have a very good structure and they are very effective making an impact by doing very clear things. And I see some people that do many things, but it looks as if their impact is not as significant. So I don't know. I think this is difficult to measure and follow up. However, I always consider that. I don't know if I'll ever get to that point though. Thank you, Isabel, for being vulnerable, for sharing that with us, for being so honest. I love that. And at the same time, I would like to say that nobody knows the answer. I simply would like to invite you to try new things, to cross your arms differently, and to learn whether that helps you or not. That's what I can think of right now, just off the top of my head. OK, we have someone else here. Cuxabel from Nicaragua, a migrant living in Costa Rica. This is a Mayan name, which means beautiful flower. Yes, that's what it means, beautiful flower in Mayan. I am from Honduras.
For our grassroots organizations, this is an essential conversation. We know that we have to get to a different point, but sometimes we are reacting, like how to react to deportation, for example. I wanted to build my future, my destiny. I'm talking about migration here. So this question, same results, less effort, This is some sort of organizational existential anguish, you know, like how to do this. I think that we have gotten some very important pointers to share them with our groups, like what to invest in. Technology, maybe a small workshop, like how to connect communities when sometimes people don't even have access to, you know, a way to top up their cell phones. I think that, you know, there is that anguish among grassroots organizations. Yeah, but this is really, really important for us because we can plan with more uh, vision Thank you, Cuxabel. Thank you for, for what you're saying. I love your name. And I don't know why you can't see me on the camera, but I would like for us to hug virtually. And, you know, let's just be patient and be disciplined. Nobody's saying this is easy. We are not alone on this way. We are all living similar things. You know, these conversations are like that. Let's have conversations with other organizations that are going through the same thing. Like, what are you doing? We don't have any more time, but please write on the chat, right? Imagine men in black. Like if I forget everything about this conversation, except for one thing, what is that one thing that you don't want to forget? Please write that on the chat. Just like that one thing you don't want to forget. All right, so uh, we are seeing here good discomfort that drives us. That's from Marinelle. So Maribel, Mario, who else? Okay, who said this? Before needs are met, they have to be seen. Yes. That's key. And that's a beautiful practice. All right, we do apologize for the technical difficulties. Hopefully you got something valuable from this. The recording and the presentation will be available. I'm sure that Maddie will be taking care of that. Ellie, thank you for your support and your follow-up. And thank you folks for your attention. Thank you for being here and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. You're very welcome. Bye.